So we're previewing some of the exhibitors and some of the people that will be at the Shrewsbury Food Festival. It's going on next weekend in the quarry. Um, now, we also have with us Sue. Tell us a little bit about what, what you do. OK, wow. I don't know where to start, really. We make British cookware. Now, Classic cookware. How did you get in to making... Well, firstly, at what point do you think that British kitchens need another pan? I've got what Andy describes as not as good as our pans. I've got some well-known French ones. They right. come in a bright orange colour. Okay. I'm not going to tell you who they are because yeah. everybody knows who they are. They're too heavy. Right. They're way too heavy to lift. And I think you'll probably agree with me, won't you? They're just, oh. So we started looking at alternatives, but we wanted something sustainable. We wanted something British. We wanted something right. quality. So let me take you back. You're in your kitchen with these pans. You love them, but they're too heavy. Mm. So what makes you think you're actually going to do something about it? We didn't actually start with the pans. Right. We started with... Um, our what is now our iconic product, which is our cast iron slow cooker. Right. And we've come from a background. My other half is the creative genius. I'm right. just the one who. I'm the when, gobby. When you I'm say the create, gobby one. When you say He's creative genius, do, does he think of things, or do you tell him? I want a good pan, but I want it lighter, and then he designs it. How yeah. does that work? He's the designer. He comes up with the ideas. Right. For. More years than he would like me to mention, he's been designing domestic appliances. Yeah. Kettles, toasters, fryers. Right. Mass-produced, made in China, sold under somebody else's brand name. Right. Probably every single one of your listeners has got something that he designed without them even knowing it. Wow. So, okay. now... At what point do you go from the ideas? And because the, you, you look on TV programs about businesses and new startups, it's not an easy thing to get into, is it? It's very, very hard, and we haven't got any backing. So we've gone, built this up from absolutely nothing. Right. So you've you've brought a pan with you. You've got one I in have, front of you. Yes. The, talk, t tell it me. Talk me through it. Tell me about it. What what is it? There right. There you go. That is. A spun iron pan. What What is spun iron? Take a machine that looks a bit like a wood lathe. Yeah. And put a pan shape on it. Yeah. Put a nice flat disc of pure iron up against it. Yeah. You get a very skilled gentleman, and I'm, they are all gentlemen because it's hard work. Right. With a tool, and he spins yeah. the tool. And press it well, uh, pushes the, that metal disc into the shape of a pan. So every one of those is actually handmade. So it's a bit like um, sculpting a, a clay thing, but using metal as the base yes. ingredient. Yes. That must be pretty challenging. It is challenging. It's hard work. Now, what? So that's how it's made. But why is that pan better than one I'd buy in any high street store? Lots of reasons, not least because it's it's hundred percent British. Yeah, that's a good start. Yep. Because of the way it's made, it shouldn't warp or buckle. Right. Because now here's the clever bit. I've learnt this. I don't know this. Okay. Metal has a memory, so yes. if you bash metal very hard yeah. and then heat it up, it will try to go back to the shape it it's originally original was. Yeah, yeah. So if you buy a cheap pan and you put it on the stove, it will buckle. Right, because it's wanting to return to its original shape. Exactly. My physics teacher would be so proud I remembered that. I don't, I'm I don't think very it's probably the impressed. only first time I've ever. Mr. Evely, if you listen, write that down. Okay, so. <laughs> but of course, these, the original shape stays the original shape. The bottom of that pan hasn't had any impact, it hasn't had any shaping. So it because it's been be, spun. Because it's been spun. Right. So now, it will stay flat. <laughs> Firstly, when you when you see what I'm thinking, when I look at that pan, I'm thinking very much of older historical pans in the way it looks and the way it's shaped. How does that work with the the problem of sticking? Right. Once it's been spun, yeah, it has a surface treatment on it. Right. Trade secret. 
Okay. okay. But we did lots of experimenting to get the right finish on that. It's then coated in natural flax oil. Flax oil, flax right. Flax oil, yes. Now, there used to be lots of flax grown all over Shropshire. Yeah, and yeah. it's mostly been replaced by rapeseed now. <coughs> so that has mm -hmm. to come a bit further. That comes from Sussex. Right, okay. okay. But it's still UK-based? Absolutely. Right. Um, flax grower, she grows it from seed, and it goes from seed to bottle on her premises. How cost-effective is that in comparison to the, the regular High Street brand that we'd all be familiar with when it comes to non-stick? These are actually mid-range pans. Okay. If you want to go and buy a pan in Tesco's, you can get one for seven ninety-nine. Yeah. Wouldn't last very long. No. You can go and buy a much more expensive pan than that. Yeah. Twice the price. Yeah. So ours sit in the middle. Somewhere in the middle. The advantage of that one over a conventional non-stick coated one. Yeah. A non-stick coated pan. First time you use it, that's the best it will ever be. Yes. The more you use it, the, the more wears that down. coating comes and off. And then eventually you have a frying pan like mine that's got non-stick <laughs> around the very edge, totally silver in the bottom, and everything has to be chiselled off the bottom. And if you ever try a fried egg or a pancake, it ain't coming out. That's right. Because that's the progression of a frying pan, as far as I know. So how this does, how does yours... How? 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 How exciting. The first time you use that is the worst it'll ever be. Right. And the more you use it, the better it gets. Isn't that right, Andy? Yeah, it kind of builds up a patina. Um, mm. I think that... So, as um, as you you kind of wear it in, it, it's like having a cricket bat. That When you have a cricket bat at first, then it needs to be worn in, and then it gets worn in, or like a nice pair of shoes. It gets more comfortable. It doesn't, it doesn't break down. It doesn't take that... So, presumably, the process of heating and cooling is adding to... However, the method of non-stick was done yes, with over secret yeah. it is, that's reaffirming that as time goes on. Now, the actual seasoning, there's no mystery about that at all. It's just a thin coating of oil and the application of heat. So we put these through an oven, but as you cook with them, you're just seasoning them as you go along. Right. So whatever you do to that pan, burn it, scrape it, scratch it, cut a knife on it. You can put some oil on, put it in your oven and restore it to good as new. So what you've explained to me, I get it now. You've pretty much got me sold. Yep. If, the, if the price is sensible and I've got that much in my wallet, I'm pretty much I'm there. How do you, at an event like a food festival, where somebody's going to walk past and you might have 30 to 40 seconds to get them to just stop and look, how do you get people in? Because that what you've told me takes a bit of explaining. Two things. One... Andy came to us, first Rosebury Food Festival, and said, yeah. this is a local event. We've right. got local producers, we've got local chefs, we are showcasing all that is great about Shropshire. Can I ask, are you unique in the fact of pan manufacturers? Are the, the, do you have any other pan manufacturer competitors in, in the Shropshire area or not? No. Right. So, so <laughs> I'm not even sure there's anybody that makes anything quite like this in the UK. So that's a no-brainer for for the for the for the organisers because yes. you're the only one. So if they don't get you, they haven't got anybody doing that. So exactly. that makes it easy. But is, do you find it easy to to hook people in, or do people walk past and say, "I've got a frying pan," and keep walking? When they see the chefs using them on stage, right? When they hear that Chris Burt only uses our woks in his restaurant and has yeah. thrown all his others away. When they see them, and that looks different from any other pan you've ever seen, they're intrigued. They want to come and they want to know about it. And, and so the, the interest comes and then people are seeking you out yes. rather than you just trying to appeal to passing trade. Yes. And how long has your business been going in terms of as pan manufacturers, if you like. Right. As the Netherton Foundry brand, the very first product went into the very first shop in August 2011. So it's a, it's a fledgling thing then? Yes. We it's... started with something that nobody had ever seen before yeah. from a brand nobody had ever heard of. Yeah. And now we're getting inquiries from not just all over Britain, but all over the world. So... What's your aspirations? Because presumably the technique that you use has limitations to how quickly or how many things you can produce in a given time, does it? Yeah. So if one of the stores 
one of the big chains across the UK came knocking on the door and says, we'll, we'll, we'll take your pans. What, what would your reaction be? We're dealing with independence. Right. We want to sell to people who share our enthusiasm, our passion for what we're doing and our interest. So we go to independent cook shops, yeah. farm shops, yeah. delicatessens, those kind of people. But and what that's if... that's where we want to be. What if you had the opportunity to get your pans into households across the UK and, and more? Is it about the, the, the process of the, that chain that you're working so closely with, or is it about telling as many possible people as can how fantastic these pans are? I want to be a household name. Right. Everybody but around this table then... has heard of Le Creuset. I yeah. want everybody to have heard of Netherton Foundry, but I want them to be going out and supporting their high street retailers. I think it's a little bit like um, it's the difference between Tyrrells and Walkers, yeah. and, and also the way that like Tyrrell started out. Then when um, Mr. Chase sort of started that company in North Hereford, then he did his research in the same way that Sabrina's done her research on all of her foods in the same yeah. way that Sue and Mark and so on. And then he created these crisps, which are brilliant chips rather than crisps, which are fantastic. And then Tesco came knocking and said, "Right, we're going to stick your. We, we've got a third party distributor. We're going to stick them on the shelves." And he said, "No, you can't." And he wouldn't let them. And then gradually the his business grew and grew and grew and became a massive, massive, massive. And I, and I think the sort of local businesses are organic in that yeah, sense. Where I, I, I've spoken to many before who just said, well, I'm not interested in that. I'm just, I just enjoy doing what I'm doing. But, but it, it was interesting that there was two sides because not only do you enjoy what you're doing and everything that goes with it, but you'd also like it to become a, a, a household name with everybody's lip. And then you're sort of in that territory, aren't you, between the two. And it's just an interesting question to explore. But it's how you do it. Yeah. Not, so not it's the, the end game of, is it's how it's how, it how is. you get there. Yes. Interesting.